Today, I'm joined by Hasni Al Joffrey, the former Plymouth defender, uh, former Man United coach, and now working uh, with the PFA. Uh, firstly, Hasni, how it's, how's it going? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Um, very happy. Lot, lots of uh, lots of uh, I guess lots of busy football things that are happening around me at the moment. So lots of learning um, every morning. So it's, it's a different challenge. So yeah, can't complain. All good. Right, so we'll just we'll just look back at your entire football and coaching journey, really. So we'll, obviously we'll go back to the start, um, and you came through the ranks at Man United, who were your boycott club. Um, what was it like to come through a such a giant club during those formative years? Uh, I guess at the time, you know, be, being born in Manchester, you, you you're probably not aware how big big the club is, if that makes sense. You, you're just a young kid playing football in the streets and in the park with your friends, and then for school, and all of a sudden. Uh, you get a knock at the door saying, you know, would, would you like to come and train at Man United at the age of eight? And I think it was eight or nine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, love Ryan Giggs, Brian Robson, all, all these. And it's like, yeah, of course. So I think at the time um, we were, I think me and a couple of other my younger friends, we, we used to sneak in at Old Trafford and watch some of the games. So it, it was like, yeah, I can't wait to get in there. And then all of a sudden things just snowballed pretty quickly in terms of be, being around the club. Um, affiliated with a club, signing official papers with a club at the you know age of nine, ten for the I think the under eleven year, and then yeah, you you know that that journey just almost uh, got going then. From I reckon you know age of six or seven, I was falling up, falling in love with football. Um, I must have been okay, I guess. And then yeah, the variety of football that I was playing was incredible. It was so much was happening around me. Man United yeah, was just another another form of playing football if that makes sense so another form of enjoyment for me so yeah amazing didn't really understand the, the size of the club and I guess the the situation I was in at the time just a young boy playing footy so it suddenly then um, I guess the longer you're there you start to realise how big the place is and you know the, the history that, that that is behind the club as well so no it was it was an amazing start to I guess a, a long journey <laughs> yeah and when you were in when you were in there obviously the class of 92 had come through those those lads are a bit older than you how good mm -hmm. was it to to see them getting given an opportunity i'm sure that must have spurred you on yeah again um the likes of uh, david beckham phil neville gary neville um Robbie savage there was quite a lot um john o'kane what i remember they used to come in keith gillespie they were older a couple of years older but they used to come in of an evening when we were training to do extras so you'd find them training with us quite a lot um, even though they were a few years older, they'd come into the cliff on a, on a Tuesday or Thursday evening. And it'd be, be like, all right, okay, the older ones are joining in with you. So that's when you're like 15, 16, you start to realise, wow, this is amazing. You know, these, you could see how good they were at the time as well. It was like, you know, they're right in front of your face. So you, they were really good, I guess, role models to, to aspire to be like. You wanted to get in that youth team. You wanted to be like, uh, I don't know, David Beckham and people I like. It, it, was, it was great. Yeah, yeah. I know you were young when you were there, hasn't he? I know Sir Alex Ferguson really built a culture and a togetherness. Um, did you have many chats or dealings with Sir Alex? Do you know what we we did have not many, but we did have a few. And they, you know the the times were it was around discipline. It was around um, your the awareness of you, how, who you're representing in terms of your family, um, the club itself. So there'd be the odd occasion where you'd be in the cliff, and all of a sudden you're going to get a drink, and then he, the manager's here. Um, and then he'd be like, right, okay. And he'd get you all in a room and he'd give you some history. He'd talk to you about respect and about manners and about, you know, timekeeping and things that I guess you look today, you think, not, 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 I'm not so sure about today. But so he was almost like a father figure for the young, young kids coming through. It was like, there's the manager. He's coming to speak to you. But it was, it was certainly around, it wasn't around the football. It was around um, how you conduct yourself, how, how you portray yourself within the club and away from the club. So it, it was great. Until you was get a little bit older, he would then turn up some nights and watch some of the uh, training. Um, he would pick some of you out to, I guess, talk to and you know give some football advice. But that wouldn't be collective. It would probably be more individual. But it was great. It was amazing to see him. Yeah. You'd, be, you'd be scared like, oh, no, he's the manager. He's here. Now you, you run a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, Hasni, that the career that you went on to have, I'm sure you kept all those values with you. Oh, absolutely. You know, I always say they stemmed, whatever, however my, my, my career has panned out, you know, I think you, 
it's got to form from somewhere and I, and I firmly believe from, from my family, my parenting, the way I was brought up, along with the, my time at Man United in terms of learning learning around values and, and uh, discipline, and you know, that, that kind of idea of, I don't know, every day is a day to get better and improve yourself and, and hard work is, is a given. You've got, to, you've got to make sure every day you give your all. It, it, it all kind of was, was bowled into one as, as a young person. Every day was a long day. However, um, it just came at both, ang you know, both angles in terms of making sure that you're giving your best every single day and that, and that gives you the opportunity to improve. Yeah. And then after that ground that you had, you joined Bolton Wanderers in 1996. Yeah. Um, you know, there were some really strong characters in that dressing room. And, you know, you had um, Mark Fish, you had John mm -hmm. Sheridan coming towards the end of his career then. You had uh, Nathan Blake, players like that. What was that dressing room like? Incredible. I mean, I I joined just a little bit earlier. It was from '94. I went into, as a as a, an apprentice. Yeah. Um, I signed my official professional contract in '96. So I had a couple of years of, of bedding in at the club and starting to understand what Bolton stood for. Um, so I had eight wonderful years at Man U. wasn't good enough. I told I wasn't big enough at the time by a certain member of staff, which is fine. You know, um, I went into Bolton. I, I don't know. With was it? Five five no's, five, you're not good enough. So I managed to get into Bolton on the fifth or sixth occasion of going, okay, we'll give you a chance. So I had two years of having the opportunity to, to almost grow into my body, um, understand, the, uh, I guess, the ideas around football and how, how football is played and starting to learn the game a little bit more, how to win. And then, yeah, I, I managed to sneak through and, and, and stick in there and, and be around some incredible uh, professionals, uh, football people, as you mentioned there, like, like say John Sheridan, Matt Fish, there was so many, Jerry Taggart, Chris Fairclough, um, Neil Cox. Honestly, I, I was I was blessed to be in the environment every single day with with, I'm talking, with real football people, uh, which give me the best grounding in terms of going into the, that professional environment. Every day, you you know, you was definitely having to to be your best, and I think. You know, if you wasn't, you, you certainly know about it. And it was, I was coming, it was almost coming to the end of the old school uh, way of almost inducting yourself as a professional, if, if that makes sense. So the there was a lot of things happening with, with our, the, you know, the young lads in terms of, you know, finding your way with it, within that training environment. It wasn't easy. It was tough. However, once you broke through it, you know, it was an amazing, amazing time. And like you say, the, the volume of football players and, and people that have come, you know, come through that, I guess professional journey going to coaching and management it was was outstanding for me, certainly for my my development. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And what was it like to to work under Sam Allardyce as well? And what was he like with you as a young player? Yeah, do you know what Sam came in? He was like the fourth manager, I think, at Bolton. I think Colin Todd came in my debut with Phil Brown. I had Roy McFarland. Um, there was a few different uh, managers that, that kind of came before Sam, and then Sam was my final manager. So Sam played me around 15 games in the Championship year, just I think the year just before he got promoted to the back to the Premier League, um, and he was good. He tried me in different positions. Sam, he, he just didn't know where 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 would I guess my favourite position. He didn't know where I would sit. He put me in midfield, left back, uh, left wing back, left of a three at the back. He just was like, I'm not sure where where to play you. He was good. He was always honest with me. He he brought in the I guess the I guess the new ways of coaching, he, he got us to think, you know, away from the grass around our, I guess you call it the four corner model, but the, it's more around the psychology and the social aspects of, of the personal development and understanding that. So Sam came in and he, and he, he changed the, the culture and the environment from you come into train at 10 a.m. and you finish that one, you're out the door, you're gone. He was, you're in about half eight, you're doing, you know, some gym work, you're going to train, you're going to have lunch here, you're going to stay behind, you're going to do some work around you. And then you're leaving at four o'clock. And that I was part of that, thinking I'm watching the older guys go through this. And it was almost like, wow, you could see like there was massive resistance, but Sam stuck at it. And it was it was great to see how within a short space of time the cog turned because we got results, because Sam knew what he was doing. Um yeah, you could see the the shift in culture in terms of a, a new way of, of management and, and I guess personal development. So yeah, that it was great to see. And Sam was was always honest with me. And when it when it came to them for me at Bolton, it, we we spoke about what what is it I'm going to do, and he's like, as I've got, I'm about to sign some big hitters here, like Joe Kev, Campo. You know, we've got all this in, in the pipeline. We've got Hierro, Camp. It's all they're all going to come. You ain't going to play. You you might play five games. You might play two games. You ain't going to play fifteen games. 
what do you want to do? Um, so he gave me, he put a contract on the table. So it's there, it's for you. You think, you know, we would love you to stay, but I also think that if you did move away, you you know, you'd start a career for yourself. Um, so then I took his advice what to do. I had loads of clubs come in for me, um, and the club were brilliant with me. They didn't put any fee on me, they just took a it was like a 50% sell on if they sold me on. So it was like Swindon, Portsmouth, Pulis, um, Dundee United. There was a few of us, and I just thought, you know, what? I'm going to get out the way and go up to Scotland and, and, and try and become a man, if that makes sense, and get out, you know, I don't know anybody there, and start to almost forge my own career. So, you know, I did that with, with Sam's blessing. It was it was great that, you know, my exit from Bolton was, was really smooth and I was always welcome back there. Yeah. And you say, Allardyce, uh, you know, you played 15 games in, in what was the Division One back then, but you actually made your debut in the Premier League at home to Blackburn. And I've just seen some of the strikers that you first came up against, Chris Sutton on debut uh, and Kevin Gallagher. And then later you played Paolo Wancho. Uh, right. You faced Craig Bellamy, Niall Quinn. What was it like, Hasney, to, you know, a young defender uh, facing those sorts of those sorts of different attackers? Yeah, I guess for me, it was it was an amazing experience at the time. You just, as a young lad, you just, every, every you know, every opportunity just playing. So you're not really thinking about anybody else. But looking back, like you say, some big names there. Um, it was it was wonderful for my education. It was it was a challenge. It was something I never I never feared. And, and as a young lad, you don't fear because I, I just think you you're full of confidence and you're full of self belief. I think there's not, I guess there's not that that fear inside you when you're such a young person. I was very lucky. Like I say, the generation I came through was I played in a really good team. I played at a really good level. And like you say, making my debut in the Premier League against Blackburn, it was the Lancashire derby, full house, twenty five thousand at the Reebok. Got man of the match as well, which was which was amazing for me. Um, I was on match of the day, so you know all the family were there. It was an amazing experience. But two days later, to put it into context, it was we played Derby County, and I'm, I'm starting the game again. Um, I was, I, my body was in bits. I couldn't even move because I was that almost. It was I was just gone from the Saturday, um, and we were four 0 down after like half an hour against Derby at Pride Park. And one shot was walking around all. All our players like Jerry Taggart, they were, not Jerry Taggart, Chris Fairclough. There was a lot of senior players that were on the pitch. And he was around tapping people's heads, like getting to wind them up. He was just tapping the back. And I'm watching this going on. I'm thinking, that's Paolo Wancho. What's he doing? So he was winding our, you know, my teammates up. And it, it was, it was, it was almost like this yin and yang. It was what an amazing experience and feeling to have two days before, like on top of the world. And I'm on, John Motson match of the day, and all of a sudden, two days, I'm, I'm stood there, and this it was a full house at you know at Derby County. We're getting beat four 0 after half an hour, and then the manager's making all these subs, and I'm looking, you're gonna you're gonna drag me off here. I'm actually thinking you, you probably better drag me off because I can't even move. He kept me on the old time. I took a severe bang off him, uh, which ruled me out for the rest of the season. He he was yeah, he caught me from behind and, and smashed my shin. It, it didn't break, but I couldn't play. But yeah, so that within three days was I was on top of the world and then lower than a snake's belly. <laughs> it was incredible, honestly. It was it was such an incredible look back now and think, wow, nothing prepare, nothing can prepare you for for that experience. But I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm certainly grateful for it. And when you say uh, Hasney that you were you knackered, obviously yeah. there's the physical element. But how much of that do you think was the adrenaline as well? Yeah, every everything. You know, like nowadays, I think like like I say. Colin Todd was a manager at the time and, and I think Colin Todd was an outstanding manager in terms of football and technique and tactics, but the, there was nothing really. We were, we were just getting to that point of like understanding the body. You know, it was still the old schooly pre-season. It was not much, you know, there was no sports science, for example. So there was no testing. So like, for example, now for me, if I would have played that game and they would, they would looked at me after the game, they probably would have put me in, a, in cotton wool for, for a week or five days and never wouldn't let me play the next game. Because it was such a high adrenaline, like you say, the physical um, output was incredible as well from what, what I went through. I was marking Stuart Ripley at the time as well. He was playing for England. Uh, yeah, I just hit, I crashed on the Sunday and I, I was I was still crashed on, on the Monday when we were playing in the Premier League game. So, yeah, no, look, I think I would never have turned the game down. Obviously, you'd never sit, turn around and go, yeah. I don't want to play. And, you know, I kept that quiet. However, I think, you know, you're looking back now, that would have been taken away from me and it would have tested me now. 
and I want to play that next game and who knows what might have happened. You know, I always look back and I wonder if, you know, that was almost like that was the start, but then it got taken away so quickly. Yeah. Anyway. And what of the strikers I mentioned, you know, Niall Quinn and, and yeah. Paolo Wanchop, they're very different strikers. You know, Niall Quinn will hold it up, he'll back in, he'll be yeah. good in the air. How much of the back then, how many times would the managers have taken you to one side and said, this is what he's good at, this is what you need to do? Or was it more about your game? Yeah, it, there was some information you'd get to know. Don't, don't get me wrong, you get to know about the opposition. Playing at that high level, there was definitely opposition analysis, but nothing like today. It was probably more about what we're doing as, as, a, as a team in terms of how we set up our team and, the, and our game plan and the tactics behind what we're going to do. And it was almost like, you know what you're up against. That's now, Quinn. You're not going to win a header. How do you bump him and drop off and, and step in front, draw fouls? Just the arts of, of defending. Because, you know, I'm only six foot. I wasn't, and he's like six foot, bloody six or something. No idea. You know, he's like a man mountain. So, the, obviously, the, you learn the skills as you go on. However... I think there was a lot of onus on yourself in terms of understanding what you was up against and doing your own research and, and then applying yourself the best you could on, on match day. Yeah, and obviously I've just listed some great attackers that you faced, but you also had a great attacker on on your side as well, Idigo Johnson. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was he like as a character and did you expect him to go to the very top as he did? Do you know what? he was? He, we signed him um, from PSV Eindhoven. He was unfit. He'd not trained for two years. He had serious ankle injury. So he was the same age as me. He came into Bolton and we, was all, we became best mates straight away. We would do everything together. So we would train, we'd, we'd go for food, we'd go out. We, we would just spend so much time together. But, and over, over a period of time, you could see he was heavy. He was, too, he was overweight, but you knew the talent was there. His first touch, his, his, his uh, awareness, his whole style was a, another level. And he was just hoping he could lose the weight and... I never forget we played Middlesbrough in a reserve game and, and me, Ida was in the team and, and Brian Robson came into our changing room, who was the manager at Middlesbrough at the time, and said, you're the best player I've ever seen to Ida in front of everybody. And I'm like looking around going, yeah, he could, I can see that. So you just, you know, over a period of time, Ida lost his weight. He got himself match fit and then what a player, what a guy. He was a he was a real character, don't get me wrong. He, he was like the, a typical like an old school type of person, he'd train his best, but then you know he'd be doing the other stuff. He'd be out and about and living the life, and um, you know, mate, of a, a young, good-looking lad, I am, I imagine. So great guy. Um, I, I see him now and again. We've played in a few charity games, and I've caught him with, with a few uh, testimonials and stuff like that. We've we've had a we've had a catch up, and we've you know reminisced on the old times and stuff. It was it was it's funny. Because he talked about you know our names, it was we would stand there and be playing you know reserve games at stadiums and or even at, you know I was on the bench in the first team. We would just wait, me and him would just look at each other. We'd stop the ball, wonder how our names are pronounced today. You know, and it was, it was honestly we would just be, be heckling and like. There was one time I was called horsey. I don't know how to get horsey, but then that was it. I was called the horse for, for a little while because the, the, the guy in the town was calling me horsey. And then honestly, we were. We were both just called all these different names. It, yeah, it was just a lottery, but it was a bit of fun before the game got going. Wow. So, yeah, the good times. He's, he's a wonderful guy. He's obviously, he went on to play at the highest of highest levels and um, a, a pure talent, one, one, one of the most natural talents that I think I've, yeah, if not one of the best, if the best I've, pl I've played with. Yeah. And then, as you mentioned, Asni, you went up to Scotland with Dundee United in the year 2000. How big was that for your development to, to play in a different league? Yeah, huge. Again, it's a, it was a decision that when they came to the, the end at Bolton Wanderers, it was, what do you do? Uh, do you stay around your own environments, around around Manchester Way? Um, when I spoke to Sam Allardyce, Sam knew I just wanted to try and play football. You know, I'd done four or five years in and around the first team and, and you know, loved it, but I needed to try and forge a career for myself and we, we, you know, we had some really good chats and it was the, the you know, the lure of playing against Celtic and Rangers, um, up in Scotland, and at that time they had the best teams. It was, it was, you're going to go up there, and it'd be full house sixty thousand, you know, at Parkhead, and it'd be full house fifty thousand at Ibrox, and you'll experience that a lot. And getting away and playing football um, will be the best thing. So, you know, with his blessing, my exit from Bolton was pretty smooth. They didn't didn't stand in my way because they knew I just wanted to play. It was the best thing I ever did. I grew up, become a man. It was, it was, it was so harsh. The environment every day was running was the fittest I had ever been. And my missus at the time, she was brilliant with me. Good job I had her because 
I was coming home every day. I was like, what is this? This, this, this? It was homesick. The training was like five times harder than Bolton. It was just full on. You've got to be the fittest. You, you, you know, you got to be fit. That's it. It wasn't to do with technique. What to do with tactics? It was we're going to run the hardest. We're going to run the more, the most. And that was the mindset, and that was the culture at Dundee United. And what a football club that was. It was special. I never knew the history behind it. With, um, I guess Jim McLean, who was the chairman at the time. What, what a what a character he was. Um, incredible. Um, so yeah, amazing two and a half years up in Dundee, on Dundee United, where I grew up to be a man and getting 60-odd games under my belt in the SPL and playing, like I say, them games against Rangers and Celtic were, were incredible. Incredible for my my journey. And always look back and think that was that was one of the best times of, of my life because of what, the change, because I knew I, I knew I could be a football player, you know, playing almost nearly two full seasons, bar injuries, which I got quite a lot of. Uh, I really had a good time. Yeah, and one of your first games was against Celtic and Henrik Larsson. What was that yeah. experience like? Incredible! It happened a good few times, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, they were, they were every occasion against against Celtic was, and Rangers were were incredible. And you're up against some big names, and like you say, there was one game. It was yeah, the, my first game was up, I was up against Larson, and he was in his he was in his palm there. It was top, and Sutton was up front as well. And you know you're looking at the team, Neil Lennon in there, Alan Thompson, Alan Stubbs. Like wow, this this is top. Um, but I, you know, played him quite a bit, and it, one of the final games, it was, it was Hartson, Sutton, and Larson up against me and two others. So it was three v three at the back against this three up front. We got beat. We was five 0 down at half time. I just remember thinking, wow, like there's no chance here. It was one of my final games for Dundee United. I did my best, but you're like three v three against that three. It's not, a, it's not an easy day. So very grateful for the experiences. Wow, top players. Um, in, incredible league at the time as well. Some real good players up there. Um, like I say, big household names, but we're, we're, we're up there playing for for the clubs and probably none so better at the time. Last summer was banging goals in left, right, so he's breaking records every every year. So yeah, to to come up against Hartson, Sutton, and Larson was up there with with the biggest challenges I had. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. And hasn't he mentioned about being homesick? Now, obviously, in today's game, you'll have like play liaison and officers. I'm sure that a lot of the players settled in. What was it like back then for you? Because moving up to Scotland is a big move for the age you were at as well. Yeah. Were you helped to settle in or was it pretty much fending for yourself, really? Yeah. No, again, it was just bang. You, you, you go and you... I, I half expected it doing doing what I, I did in terms of make, you know choosing to go up to Scotland. I half expected this was not going to be easy. However, in terms of a signing for the club, I remember signing. Um, my missus came up with me and we that was it. We're up. We're going to try and find our way around Dundee and survive. And we were both, like I say, we were both up there. And I remember ringing my mum a good few times. He's like, I can't believe I'm up here. I was dead upset. I was like, dead homesick. Like, all, I, all I knew was Manchester. All I knew was my family, my friends. But she helped me stick it out. And we, you know, we, we, we got through. And then the club realised, I think, in the end, it was getting to me that much that they, they had me in a, they had me in a, not a B&B, but they had me like in a family run kind of place which I, I just wanted my own space with with my own time finish football and, and just get out of there so they, they put me in a lovely hole over, overlooking the, the Tay which is like it's probably about a million pound house yeah. <laughs> best thing they ever did for me because we got me and the missus got in there we, and we were just together and it was we were just growing up together and all of a sudden that settled me down and yeah over the period of time it, it eased out but there was no player care there was no support in terms of right how are you feeling as what you know what do you need there was none. We just literally went bang. Which for me, looking back, um, I say you swing, you sink or swim. But it was great again going to Scotland. But that was part of that growing up to be a man. It was, it was um, certainly something where, when, when I look back now, I think it was probably the best thing for me. Yeah, and your manager at Dundee United was Paul Sturrock, um, and you actually follow Paul to three different clubs after Dundee United. How mm. big an impact did he have on your career, and especially in? At Dundee United when you were when you were a younger player, yeah, he was like I said, I didn't really know Paul before before I signed for Dundee United. Um, first first moment I got with him, we sat in in, in his office at, in Dundee, and we were talking football, and he was like, "Okay, we want you to do this today," and I didn't know who it was. And then you know you, you start you know your phones are coming out this time, 
start to realise, you know, the history of Paul Sturrock playing for, for Dundee United and Scotland and doing what he's done. It's like, right, okay, he's a real football man. Um, he was brilliant for me. He he took a shine to me um, pretty early on. He, he he understood, I guess, the way I like to play football. I think he agreed. I like to pass the ball. It was all around technique and I don't know. It was just having a bit of arrogance when you play and just a different level to maybe what he'd seen in Scotland. I think it was... He'd been so used to that hard work, 100 miles an hour, fit, fit, fit. And he, he put it, I don't know if it took him by surprise, but I, because, because my, I guess my journey to that point was very much Manchester United with Brian Kidd, Nobby Styles. Um, these guys were, were teaching me around first touch, around uh, detail, weight of pass. And it was all around that, you know, being the most extreme, best, best of the best technically. So Paul kind of gathered that. I guess that mindset of me, he's a football player. So he left pretty early in. I think it got to him. The club, I didn't realise how, how, how close the club was to him. We struggled the first year, we survived. But he went off to go to Plymouth Argyle. And then, yeah, there was a there was few conversations in between the couple of years I was there. Would you like to come to Plymouth? I'm like, no, I probably want to get near back home now after leaving, you know, Manchester area. <laughs> yeah. And then I was, I was about to sign for Bradford City. And then the big TV deal ruined it all. Um, nice. They came in to buy me. I was I was going to earn like quadruple my money. Um, I was I was playing for Dundee United at the time. It was it was going to be a really big move for me coming back to Manchester. Bradford was, were doing really well in the league as well, and then all of a sudden the ITV they all just collapsed. It was like, no, we can't do it. And then Paul uh, man, managed to give me a call. I said, what well, you know? Do you still want to leave? I'm like, I don't. I'm not even sure now. I said, look, we'll, we'll take you down here if you want to come. I don't, you know, instead of signing a three year deal, why don't you just sign to the end of the season? See how you feel. See how, if you like Plymouth and. Got into the manager's office at uh, Dundee United, and I was like, "Look, I still want to go." And he was like, well, "Where are you going to go?" I said, "I'm not sure. Just terminate my contract." And I'm like, "No." And then I think there was some kind of little payment, I believe, from Plymouth to Dundee United, and that was really when I went down there. It, the, I think the relationship really took off with, with me and Paul Sturrock. Um, he realised what I did to go down there and go and play for him, and then it just blossomed from there. I stayed there. I loved Plymouth. I loved. Uh, I love the area. I love. I love. Uh, what was the word? What he, he kind of. We spoke about it. It was almost. It just suited me at the time in terms of where the club were going, where I wanted to go. I'd played enough games to to almost establish myself within that team to to make them do do well or go go to challenge to, to get promoted. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, it it was a start of almost uh, of a, a real strong working relationship with Paul Sturrock. Yeah. And uh, you joined Plymouth in 2002. Uh, they were in the third tier at the time. And then you actually won the title in 2004 up to the championship. And yeah. um, what are your memories of, of that time? Yeah, amazing. Again, probably the, the story of my life was I was, I, was in, I could have played double the amount of games, but I was injured that many times. I think I only played maybe just over 20 games that year. That year. But, it, you know, it was an amazing season because... And I never forget we just we just started the season really strong. We just kept going. We had a, a great nucleus of players, a small squad, but very very together. Change room was fantastic, and yeah, I remember um, we were nicking wins. We were getting clean sheets. The, the spine of the team was really strong, and then yeah, the back second part of half of the season that we we just went on a roll. I remember I remember like there was a lot of talk about Paul Sturrock, you know, potentially going. There was a lot of clubs coming in for him. Um, and before, yeah, that was it. We, we got ourselves to a point before the end of the season and uh, Paul Paul left for Southampton. Uh, I'm not sure how many games, maybe six, six, six games it in, in before the end of the season. So he left um, and you're wondering, you know, you're kind of wondering, are we going to see this through? And it got a little bit squeaky bum time, but we managed to pull it off. But yeah, it was one of the best experiences of my football in life, absolutely, to win to win the league at home park against QPR, full house, 20,000, get man of the match is one of them ones. Uh, it just <laughs> seems to just all, all go right for me, I guess. And I, I always I go down there quite a bit now because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for a charity down there and I do a lot of commentary for, for the club and I just have fond memories of my time down there. And I think from that year, it was almost... I guess that's the foundations of, I guess, my love affair with the club. Yeah, and it, it was a bit of a golden era for the club in terms of just, you know, it, I feel like a lot of the names in the team were just instantly recognisable. You know, you had 
uh, David Norris, Akos Buzaki, uh, David Frio, Paul Watton. I remember the right back Paul Connolly. Um, what was that dressing room like and the camaraderie? Yeah, incredible. Like like I say, it, it wasn't the biggest changing room. However, it was it was an incredible time for us all. We were all very much alike in terms of we worked that we were the fittest lads because Paul, like I said, Paul had that mentality. We, we were going to run more than anyone. But we had some talent in that in that changing room, like you say, David Frio. Um, Dave Norris, uh, some somebody like I say, Paul Watton was a, a stalwart of the club. We had Graham Coughlin, who, who was, a, was a really strong leader at the back as well. So there was some, like I say, some really good dynamics in the team. Mickey Evans up front, uh, real character. Um, so yeah, no, that changing room was special. We, we were all very much similar in age, around 25, 24, 25, 26. Um, incredible, like I say, every day we come in, we'd have a right laugh. Uh, with a lot of banter going on but we trained we, we, we were fit we trained our best and we knew we had a formula to win games we knew when the goal got tough we were the fittest and we stuck together and you know, I reckon around 15 of us really that, that supported that, that that journey through the end of the season that I guess got us up and like you say the likes of Bazaki then turns up um, in the next next year or year after what a talent he was again reminded me of Idigo Johnson with the absolute highest level of technique what a football player what a great guy as well one of the nicest men you'll ever meet uh, Marcos Pazaki so yeah um, started to add some real quality players as we I guess journeyed through the league went up to the to the championship yeah. and as you said hasn't he that title winning season you, you did have an injury and you actually went on loan to, to Sheffield Wednesday was yeah. that just to get your fitness that was a that was here we got promoted um, yeah. I had done my knee in the final game against QPR, I think. And then we, as we got promoted, I knew there was something wrong with my knee. Um, I tried to do pre-season, couldn't do it. So then the operation was out for six weeks. And then at the time, like the, the team were winning the championship, doing okay. They were, they were trying to you know, get results, etc. And then what happened was Bobby Williamson came up to me and said, look, we want you to play. Paul Sturridge's coming to you. And to, to take you on loan. We don't want you to leave. However, if you want to go and play for a month, um, go and do it, you know, and get some match fitness and come back here and go and compete and get back in the team playing the championship with us. I'm like, yeah, what a club. Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday, what a, what a club that is. Massive. It transpired. Paul Sturrock could not even join Sheffield Wednesday yet. So he, he was just agreed to take the job. And then that phone call I got from, from Paul then, he was like, look, I spoke to the club. They said, it's down to you. I'm going to take the job just like today. I want you there tomorrow with me. We're going to join, come in at the same day. I'm like, right. So I did. He joined. I went in that, that, that morning. It's like people looking around going, what's he doing here? Uh, I knew some of the players at the time. It was like, right, here we go. It was, And that was there yeah, for me to get match fit. But what happened was Paul, I think they played two or three games. And then Paul's like, we're, we're going to buy you. We're going to put an offer to buy you. Would you want to stay? I'm like, I love Plymouth. But what an opportunity this is to go and play for, for a massive club in Sheffield Wednesday, a little bit now closer to home, finally, maybe. Um, and then I got a severe injury. Um, I fractured my shoulder, broke three ribs. I, I tore my cartilage and I got a poison foot all in one move in that in the game against MK Dons. And that scuppered the whole lot. I was out for the rest of the season, more or less. So I was running back. Against MK Dons, it was a corner running back. Is on McLeod? I don't know if you remember him. He was just yeah, very good. Yeah. Guy, and it was an accident. He's just clipped the back of my foot. I've gone tumbling down, and that's it. It literally, all my left side was, it was smashed in. My knee went and everything. And then at half time, I, I carried on to half time. It was like, I don't think I can play here. I'm not sure what's going on. And the doctor injected me, give me a cortisone, which he shouldn't have done. Um, and I played the whole second half like this with my arm down somehow against them and well that that kind of killed me off there I knew after the game I was a mess went down to Plymouth and like what's happened so I'm not sure I've got this this is a problem my ribs sore my knees sore my foot is like it's, it's massive so they sent me for the scans and x-rays it's like oh this come back you've fractured you've, you've torn your rotator cuff you've got an evulsion fracture on, on your shoulder you broke three ribs no wonder you can't breathe your knee is actually you've, you've torn your meniscus again and you thought you've got some something's happened on your foot where you poisoned it. Honestly, I was an absolute mess. So I went back to Plymouth. They weren't happy. 
with what had happened, obviously. So yeah. within within six, seven weeks, of, six weeks before, I just had this knee operation. Yeah. Seven weeks later, I'm having it again. And all this, all this other stuff's happened. So, yeah, it, it was a... Because I'm guessing it was such an innocuous thing. You're yeah. probably, not, and the way you've gone down, you're probably not, th- you know, it's hard to imagine getting all those injuries in just one, one, well, one well, incident. My missus was with, with my kid at home in Plymouth and uh, I'd finished the game on Saturday and I couldn't, I couldn't get in my car to get to the hotel to get back to Manchester to my mum's house. Yeah. Um, I needed loads of help and then, I, I was telling my missus, I'm, I'm not in a good way. I'm not, I'm not sure what's happened to me, but I'm struggling to get my stuff out there, out the, the hotel to get home. And she's like, "What's nothing wrong with you? You, you, you? You're always like this." And anyway, I managed to get back to Plymouth on the Sunday evening, and I, and I literally like scraped through the, the the doorway. She's like, "What's what's going on?" And that was it. Like all oh, this kind of transpired the next morning. Um, they looked after me, Plymouth. Absolutely. They obviously very disappointed what had happened. Want to please with how I was dealt with that. You know, half time, I should have come off probably straight away. But probably half of that was me. I just wanted to play. I'm sure it's like that mentality what I've grown up with. It was just keep going, you know, don't worry about it. That, that's that's how I grew up. But then that kind of it was a detriment because that was it. It was 10 months out. I'll, that was the rest of the season done for me until the next year in the championship when I got myself fit by the end of that previous year and I was ready to go for that pre-season. Yeah. And if it wasn't yeah. for that injury, hasn't he? Do you, what do you think? Do you think he might have stayed at Sheffield Wednesday? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and looking back at it, yeah, I mean, maybe it might have been the right time. He was, again, following Paul Sturrock, who I knew, he, he, you know, he, he was brilliant with me. However, it would have been sad, very, very sad to leave Plymouth. But again, looking back at it, things happen for a reason, right? So, you know, I went back to Plymouth and ended up playing like nearly, I don't know. There was a lot of games I played in the Championship that next year under Tony Pulis, under Ian Holloway. Played a lot of games um, for them. But, you know, Sheffield Wednesday were, were fantastic and I've still got a, even though I was there for a short time, they still speak to me a lot. They still ask me to do stuff for them in terms of, you know, some some commentary and um, these, these people up there who run char- charity games that ask me to go and play for the, for the Sheffield Wednesday part and Absolutely, you know, that even was a short time, I, I, had a, I had a great feeling that, that club was so big. It was an amazing feeling. I was privileged to be a part of the club. However, like I say, I went back to Plymouth and I had probably the best time in my career in terms of yeah. playing um, consistently well for, for the club. Yeah, it was it was a good time for me when I got fit. Yeah, and as I mentioned, that Plymouth team, just the names are just so synonymous and Plymouth really held their own. What was it like going, you know, the, the championship is full of massive clubs. Yeah. What was it like for, for Plymouth going there and you know getting results and, and competing with these teams? I think do you know what? I think it was there was a little bit of there was a couple of times where we knew we was out of our depth. There was some massive games. We played at West Ham once at Upton Park and that was another five nil and it could have been ten. And they had some top, top players on the pitch. Um you're looking around thinking, do you know what? We we actually have give our you know our all here, but we we're just not at the level. However, if you flip it, there was a lot of lot of occasions where without four teams, we've we'd had, we had a better game plan than teams and we got some really good results. And certainly when Tony Pulis took over, he gave us that he made us extremely fit again um, and organized and together. And so we, we were nicking one nils and nil, there was nil nils and we stayed in in the league. And then the year after when Ian Holloway took over, he, he inherited a a really strong, fit, organised team from from Tony, which was fantastic. That's what we needed, absolutely, to stay up. But then Oli put his slant on it, and Oli was such a different manager. He never really coached us. He was a motivator. Yep. And he came alive on match day and, and gave us some wonderful speeches to try and win games, and, and he, he pulled it off a good few times. So I think the club were lucky. Now we transitioned and kind of evolved over the two or three years we were up in the, in the, in the Championship before I left, yeah. Yeah, and what was it you mentioned, Tony Pulis? Yeah. What was he like as a manager? And, and you know, did you expect him to one day be a Premier League manager? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, t- Tony took me by surprise. I, I didn't know much of Tony uh, before he, c- he came in. But then, absolutely um, top, top class, like Sam Allardyce. Seeing, seeing, seeing past the techniques and the, I guess the 
the fitness or the tactics. He made us do more. He got us to watch videos. He gave us stats, give us data. He gave us information about how to win a game, how not to lose a game, watching video clips. And he knew exactly what he wanted. Um, we were super fit. We were super organised. And I was very lucky to have uh, Tony as part of my learning throughout the journey because he, he came in with a, yeah, a, a very clear plan, very organised and simple, clear plan of, of not getting beat. And then, you know, being so organised, we used to call it the cage. I was centre half with the other, and we had two centre fielders just in front. And we he called, we, we'd stick together, we'd roam around the pitch within 15 yards, and it was like nothing breaks the cage, and you'll win the game. We'll have a. It was Nick Chadwick, who was the number ten. He was always the one who was in front, but he did the most running. He was everywhere, but we stuck as a four, and it was like nothing's going to pierce this. Wherever we was, you'll be the we'll, you'll be like the strength within the team. And it happened, you know. We were, we weren't conceding goals. We were we were solid everywhere. It was it was it was a great learning experience for me. It was like wow, not seeing this championship. You know, we were beating West Brom. We were beating loads of teams. The teams were getting frustrated, but we were we were sticking out. And then all of a sudden, the fitness and the we had a, a game plan of like you know it was I forget how many touches it was before getting a shot off at goal. But we were getting down to this point where we get we get the ball up to the box within three passes. We've got a great chance of shooting at goal and also scoring. I think it was something like that. So yeah, we were. It, it was a wonderful experience and, and one that I've always remembered through Tony in terms of the organisation and the management of it. Yeah, because and that's the thing, isn't it? Although you know the le- you said about West Ham away, yeah. you know the levels. But managers who are so organised, you know, they they get a good a reputation for a reason, don't they? Because it does get results. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tony was very, very good. And like you say, probably with better players, that's probably why he's worked in the Premier League. He's, I would imagine he's, he's got a really clear game plan. And with better players, you, you're also going to get a little bit more, right? You're going to get a bit more on the ball. And um, I probably think, yeah, it didn't surprise me when he's, he's worked in the Premier League. No, and, and still now, he's, sometimes I see him on, you know, like some of the social media channels talking about his experiences and what his thoughts are. And I'm like, yeah. I absolutely see what you're saying there. Very intelligent, you know, a, a wonderful, experienced uh, football man, Tony Pulis. Yeah, and then you, you had another iconic name manager. It was Ian Holloway, as you mentioned. Yeah. What are your memories of him? What a character. Uh, so different to what I've ever had. Um, a man manager, somebody who wanted to inspire, to motivate, Um yeah, just unique in, in his approach to, to, to football. Uh, like I say, didn't really see much of him on the training ground. He had his staff uh, doing most of the coaching on, on the on the training ground. And Oli, you know, he, he'd be gone for days with his family, I think. Um, and then he turned back up on a Thursday or a Friday, match prep. And then Saturday, it was like, wow, this guy is in the changing room. He's dancing. Tunes are flying on. It's like, he's like, wow, here's Oli. Uh, you know, he just got you to feel really good about yourself. He just inspired you, and he couldn't wait to give you that that speech before game. So, Ollie, Ollie's, Ollie was outstanding and amazing in terms of motivating you uh, to be the best version of you, and and to be brave and to go out there and enjoy the football. And um, he, he wanted you to express yourself, Ollie. He was he was fantastic. Such a, a polar opposite to, to Tony in terms of he was more free. He was he was more expression. However, just the same as Tony in terms of absolutely brilliant in what they did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, re- a really positive character, Ian, but what was he like uh, after a defeat? Uh, yeah, not, not to, I guess for, 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 from what I remember with him, he wasn't too bad. Um, he, you know, he'd had his disappointments and sometimes he'd have a little rant. However, he'd be quickly forgotten about and then a week later, you know, you're in the training ground again. If he's, when, when you saw him, it was like we're preparing for this next game and it's, how's your family? What's happening? What's going on? What have you been doing? It's the man management of, of Oli. Certainly when, you know, he was playing in this team, he was top. He was, he was top, top. And I saw Oli not long ago. We played in a in a charity game down in Plymouth. He was the manager of the opposition team and I'm watching him, looking at him as a character. He's got his flat cap on and bouncing around he's like yeah he's like larger than life and like it's, you know we had a really good chat he's, he's just st- still the same as what i remember um so we exchanged numbers and we, yeah we, we're about to uh, we're gonna have a good chat me and ollie about about my experiences with him and stuff so yeah what a guy yeah. what a guy yeah and in 2006 plymouth actually played real madrid in a friendly and yeah. i remember ian holloway actually fell off his chair when he was when he was asked about that what are your what are your memories of, of that of that friendly 
Yeah, um, a wonderful occasion. Very proud uh, for everyone in Plymouth to to experience such a such a football match against Real Madrid. For me personally, you know, to be asked to be captain of the game, uh, lead the lads out, that was a special moment for me. It was it was a privilege to do that, and yeah, it was an experience with called them the Galacticos, right? They were all there, you know, not all of them played, but they were all there, and I was marking Baptiste through up front. There was. Like I say, Guti was playing. There was lots. Jonathan Woodgate was playing. There was a lot of top top players on that pitch. And you're like you're looking around, going, "Wow!" And we and we we shouldn't have got we shouldn't have got beat. We were we were we had some chances to to score, and we conceded a penalty. I think Lily and Alice give a free, you know, get a bit of a kick off. I don't know, they kicked someone by accident. The referee give a, just give a penalty. You're like, oh no, and he scored the penalty. And yeah, we got beat one 0 But it was a, it was an amazing experience for everybody. And like I say. Um, it, I always get asked about the game. It's just a surreal moment for playing for Plymouth against Real Madrid. But the story behind it was they they were quite cute. We 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 managed to get in this wonderful hotel in Austria, which we've been to before, and it was like top top. And you think you know this is going to be a really good you know experience for pre season. We're going to be fit, but the I guess the quality of the hotel allowed you to to have recovery. And it was it was it was a top top hotel. And we got told Real Madrid wanted our hotel at the same time. They'd pay for us in to be another top hotel and also give us a game. So that and then why not? Eh? Come on, then we'll do it. No problem. <laughs> so we moved in this other hotel and it, that was amazing. It was it, it was incredible. And then yeah, we got the game against against Real Madrid and, and yeah, like I say, this the memories for me when I look back in you know the my football journey. It was it was one that I, I've always remembered. Yeah, and there's a great picture of you next to next to Goosey before the game. Yeah. And what was the the difference, hasn't he? In terms of, I'm sure that like Real Madrid, you know, the technical ability must have been massive. But how did that? I know it was only a friendly, but how did that game differ to your your championship games? Um, I think I always remember the, there was a there was a level of arrogance and there was a there was a presence on the pitch. It was like this aura around each player. Every single player was yeah it was outstanding technically. But they just they just had this 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 feeling of that like extreme confidence, and I'm looking I'm, I'm I'm thinking now thinking about we we were all like not rabbits in headlights but we were just like these guys who were running around trying to defend for our lives and when we had the ball we we were attacking and we were doing what we was doing but I just remember looking around thinking these these guys have got levels here they've got gears they can go up definitely uh, it was a privilege to share the pitch with them and I'm sure like, like everyone else would say the same it was. Yeah, a wonderful occasion for everyone. Uh, probably for us, we were, we were very nervous, uh, very excited, uh, like little kids, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they're on the same pitch, and you could you could feel it was. Just, it was a, I always said that when I used to come up against top players, there was a there was a feeling, a presence around them, which which oozed confidence. Not not too far away, it was cockiness. It was just a confidence and an arrogance about that. They trusted themselves on the ball, that they would be able to change a game at any given moment. So yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and from the big names of Real Madrid to the, a big name from Inter and AC Milan, Taribo West. Um, yes. What was that like when he was at Plymouth Argyle? Taribo, what a guy. What an amazing man, by the way. Wow. Um, bald in the change room. Not sure how he signed. He used to run with a limp. Um, got him through the door somehow. Yeah, this guy came from AC Milan into Milan, played in World Cups and then Taribo West. And yeah, he was... Um, he wasn't fit, but what a guy to have in the changing room, right? And he was ultimately there to take my position. So I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do here now against him? This is Taribo West. But we were doing pre-season, never forget it. And it was like we were doing like eight 200-metre runs or something. Like, this is not easy, but, you know, you can do it. Uh, I remember Taribo, first run. Boom, oh, sprints. He's about 30 yards ahead of every single person. You're thinking, right, out. Wow, what's going on here? But it's a really crazy run. Gets to the other end, and it's like we're about to go again. Whistle's about to start, and we go, and he stood still. So we get to the other side, we come back up again, and he's still there. I'm like, what's Taribo? We're going. He's like, no, 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 I do one. <laughs> I do one. <laughs> I do one. <laughs> and that kind of set the scene with Taribo. He was Taribo, right? And Taribo did what he wanted to do in terms of his managing, you know, what an experience. But he wasn't fit, and no idea how they signed him. <laughs> But what a what a beautiful um, human being he was. He was so empathetic with with everybody. He, I remember, 
getting to know him a little bit. Um, such a lively character came in. He'd, he'd bring coffees in for for the players. He'd bring food in, and he'd, he'd give he'd, he'd give clothes away. He, he he was just this guy who was so generous, and you get, you start to understand a little bit about him. And then a lot of his wages were going to the local charities. He was giving his money away. Honestly, you start to realise this guy's here. It's it's not really just the football. He's obviously turned up at Plymouth somehow. Not, he probably doesn't even know himself, but he's there and. He he was just this guy, which I don't know. Like on another level, he was almost a, he was like a superstar in his country. But he came to Plymouth and he was very humble, very very open, very giving. And I love being around Taribo. In the end, he, he had no chance of playing because he wasn't fit. Um, but he used to give me some tips and ideas, and I used to talk to him a little bit about about defending and what would you do here, what would you do there, and I'd watch him in training sometimes when he was when he could train. Could see actually when he was on his when he was on his peak, he would be top class. Yeah, he had everything to the physique, speed, power, good good on the ball. So yeah, Taribo, even though he was short lived, uh, what a what a guy. Honestly, one of the best guys I've ever met in football because purely he he came with no arrogance. He came, he just came as this this guy who was playing football, did his own thing, uh, and was so giving. So yeah, wonderful person. And what was his presence like on a match day in the dressing room? Was he a leader or was he was he more quiet? All of life. Yeah, he wasn't playing much. He was on the bench, hardly played. But he was, he was full of life. He was picking you up and giving you big hugs. And yeah, honestly, just something that I'd never, you know, you, you know, it's like if you're not playing, you're kind of like not down in the dumps. You know, you, you still want to show some kind of, you know, character when you're there. But he was just this big all encompassing uh, big family giant with lots of love to give and lots of support and yeah on the coach on the way there in the change on the way back whether he played or he didn't play he was just so loud and honestly one of the, one of the best characters I think you know people have asked me about him before I've not really said too much but he, he, when I look at it I just I think his mission was just not, not the football it was something else I'm not sure what it was but you're talking about human beings and about being a good person, about you know, you know, humbleness, empathy, you know, care, love. He epitomised all of that, and it, it kind of uh, it was great to, to be around him. Love being around him. Top guy, amazing. And then um, you said, hasn't he? You know, you you did have your injury problems at Plymouth, and then in 2007, you you joined Oldham on loan. Was it apparent that your time at Plymouth was going to come to an end? Yeah. Um, Oli, Oli was good to me. Oli was on. I played a lot of games for Oli, but he was looking to go a different way. He signed some. Uh, what's going outside here? He signed some uh, some players that were a little bit different profile to me. More, I guess I was a footballing centre half. I like to play the game. Um, I kind of bounced off the bigger guy next to me, but he brought a couple of new players in, which is which is fine. Um, we had some good chats, and um, it was like, oh, look, as I'm going, I'm thinking I'm going to go down this road here. You know, I love you being around here. I know you've been here quite a while. You're a bit of a Plymouth, you know, a bit not a Plymouth legend, but you've you've won the hearts of the fans here. And I'm not I'm not gonna ever gonna tell you you need to go, but if you want to keep playing, you're not gonna play too much here for me. And that, that honestly is all you need. And um, yeah, I won't play too much. Uh, I was injured actually again <laughs> before I went to Oldham that time. I went to yeah, John Sheridan, my teammate, he ran me up and said as we're you know we're going to get into the playoffs. So, you know we need some reinforcements. Do you want to play? I'm going to play your left back. Oh, I'm like I don't play left back. Shaz, I'm not played there since I was a kid. I said don't worry, don't want you to get over the halfway line. Just we just want to bowl so we've got enough flair players in the team. So I ended up playing. Played the four games. Did okay. Not a left back though. Did all right. And then I was like it was the end of the season. Kind of finished off there. Um, didn't really enjoy the playing left back. It was more. I wasn't. You know you, you think to yourself. You need to do more. Here. There's more to be given for a left back. You need to be up and yeah. down, crossing the ball, and be a bit more creative. I was, I wasn't a left back fitness. I wasn't fit for left back, if that makes sense. I was a centre half fit, um, which is it's a different one, I think, from being a full back. So, did a month there. <clears throat> it was great to see Shez. Some really good players in that team as well, like Chris Taylor. Um, yeah. Great guys. One of a character. But uh, yeah, the season finished then. Yeah, and then you. Yeah, you joined Swindon. Yeah, went back, again. yeah, went back to Plymouth, and then it, that was it. Like, oh, I spoke to Ollie again, and Ollie's like, "Look, I've got a good few clubs coming for you there. There's, you know, some clubs around Manchester um, will match your wages." Um, and then we've also had 
Paul Sturrock on on the phone just got promoted. Uh, he wants to see you as well. So, so I still had a year left at at Plymouth. So I ended up going up to speak to Luggy. Um, had a bit of banter. He said, "Look, guys, we're you know we're we're a good team. Some young lads in here. We'll make you captain straight away. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. We, uh, give you a three year deal. What's your thoughts? You know, you know, you know what I you know what I think about you. So." Yeah, I did it. You know, it was it was sad to, to leave Plymouth. However, again, it was to join up with somebody who trusted me and had a had a wonderful relationship with 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 the ex, you know, the, I guess the the past and and all the experiences that we shared together. Yeah, and I think Swindon were newly promoted to League One, but Paul Sturrock actually left in the November. Yeah. Was that a setback for you personally? Yeah, I think so. Again, you know, you, you're almost not signing for Ply- uh, for Paul himself it was a big factor, obviously. Coming to Swindon, which was living near London, you're moving. You know, I thought the next move were probably nearer home then, but I did move to 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 Swindon for. I guess Paul was a big factor. And then he left, and then it's crazy how it happened. So he left, and then you know, as he was leaving, he pulled me in the office as as I'll take you back if you want to come back to Plymouth. I'm like, I, I don't think I can do it now. I just think like that's. I was captain. I was doing really well that first year. I was I was. Having a really good year with, with Swindon Town, um, so he'd left, and it kind of like the club went to a little bit of a I don't know, was that like disarray? If I'm honest with you, it was he left, but they they, they had uh, Morris Malpass took over about a month later, I think, uh, and see, and seen us through that year, and yeah, that that first year at Swindon was a good year for me in terms of my playing every game more or less and captain, and we did all right. We could we we should have been in the playoffs. But, you know, we would have been if Paul would have stayed, definitely. Morris took over, new to the English football. He was a legend up at Dundee United. What a guy. Another what a wonderful person. Um, but, I don't know, I don't think the squad was big enough to, to maintain a push because we were quite a young squad, but a small squad. So I stuck out at Swindon and, and told Paul, no, I don't think I can I can go back to Plymouth now. I've, I've made my decision. I'm up here now and see how it goes. If, these, if Swindon wants to get rid of me then, I'll be edging towards back up near Manchester now because that's yeah. it's almost a dummy time away, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in recent times, hasn't he? You know, um, Swindon have been in like the third and fourth tier, but it, it's a big football club, isn't it? Um, yeah. And, you know, what, what was it like playing there? I loved playing the first year. Um, I had a great rapport with the fans, like I say. They, they, they were great to me. Um, Swindon Town, what a, you know, football club. It's, you know, Glenn Hoddle, people like that. He's been in the Premier League. It's, it's a club that's got lots and lots of potential. You know, when I just think at the time when I was there, it was there was changing ownerships, it was we weren't being paid. There was a lot of lot of madness happening behind the scenes, which was a shame. But you just knew if that club got itself together with the right people behind it, it's got potential to 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 do really well. So unfortunately the second year, uh, my knee uh, was a bit of a mess throughout the year and, and that was more or less the I don't know, we were struggling. And I was taking the brunt of it from the fans because I was coming out and talking to the to the to the media. You know, it was getting beat, and it was I don't know. The fans turned on the local lads a little bit, which if the you know it's fine, get it because they're there to you know they're there to support the team. If they don't see what's happening, it is is right for them. Then they've got the, their own opinions and they can express them how they want. But it was me who kept coming out, who kept coming out, and I was talking. You know, you know, we, we need to stick together, and it was like I was getting. It. I was getting the blunt end, which is which is fine. But then I got a serious injury um, just before Danny Wilson took over. Um, that was more or less the end of me. It was the sick. It was the fifth operation on my right knee in terms of my cartilage, and then it was we went to another surgeon. It was like you, there's there's a bit more damage in here. You, you're going to struggle to get back fit now. This could be the end of you. So it took me yeah a good ten months really. 10 months into the new season into the yeah it was it was christmas time 2008 or 9 i think yeah 2008 i think it was just before danny wilson came in yeah and then we got to the end of 2009 nearly yeah nearly 2000 that was it and i was fit but not fit i couldn't train it was like the ledley king injury um but Danny, Danny took over he brought in some great players like golden gray um top player by the way you know he was captain, and yeah, I will, he moved on with his team. His team evolved. It was a top. It was a really, really top team. Some great guys in the changing room, and I was there trying to just do my own thing and get fit. To I think in the end, move on. But 
yeah, Dan, Danny made it hard for me. It was a bit of a shame, really, because I never fell out with what, any one of my managers in, in the past. Right. And um, like I say, I think my relationship with the fans weren't great. wasn't great because of obviously me being the captain, having to speak out, got myself nearly fit, and then I couldn't train properly. And he didn't understand and that I couldn't train. I was trying to do stuff on the bike, and the injury was like, if you train, you're not going to be able to move the day after or two days after. And then, yeah, it, it was like he was just do, doing everything to get me out of the club. Um, I got a family I was going through, you know, personal issues and lots of things were happening behind the scenes where he was just trying to get me out. And, and some some things that he was doing, it was like, I won't, I won't say I'm on here now, but it was, yeah. was the first time I'd experienced something where I was like, I can't believe how you're treating me. Yes, this is bad, bad. So in the end, <laughs> the club paid me up. Didn't expect me to get another club. Um and then yeah, when when they when they paid me up to leave, I was obviously grateful. It, it was it was it was the right time. Um, I said with the Danny Wilson situation, it was something that stuck in me was would be how you never treat somebody ever. You know, I would never do that. What to to, to anyone else? What he did to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, signed. You know, kind of finished my contract, and then yeah, I, I moved and signed for Oldham Athletic for three months or so. But they he, with the manager Dave Penny at the time, he knew I couldn't run. He was. He just wanted me in the changing room to be, you know, a senior voice and and support the group, which was uh, wasn't doing too well. Um, the chairman Simon Corney and him, they just what you know didn't earn too much money, if anything, really. Just being around lads, I managed to get one game at Yeovil, and I couldn't yeah. move after it. Like wow, no. it's funny enough when I finished the season, um, I could have had another year at South End with Paul Sturrock. <laughs> he wanted to sign, <laughs> and I said, Paul, I literally can't run. I'll be taking your money, and it, and I'll be you'll be paying me up. And I, I don't. I just don't think it's fair on on you or yourself, and that you you take me. So mm. that was when I knew, kind of like, I need to call it a day. And even though I was just turning thirty two, it was sad. But I, I just I couldn't move with my knee. Yeah. And when when that with that injury, Hasney, when you were at Swindon and you were out for the ten months when Danny Wilson came in, you you said you had things going on in your personal life. You had the issue with the manager. But in mm. this interview, you've mentioned a lot that you you know you like to be home and that you were homesick and Dundee United during yeah. that time out. How often were you in Swindon, and how often did you have the opportunity to to go home? Uh, not much, if I'm honest with you. Um, Danny had me in training at like six am, six thirty am. He'd, he'd make he made life. So I was out um, at the time. Like I can say now, I was going through a divorce with with the wife, um, my little lad. Um, he was taken as well. So from what I'd had in terms of family environment. From playing football and everything was like I had a routine. It kind of everything kind of imploded. So I was out injured. I was in this massive house in Swindon on my own. wasn't seeing my kids. I was going through a divorce. Things were happening behind the scenes. Where I was like, "What's what's happening?" I'm trying to see my son and stuff like that. And then um, he would have me in at daft, daft times where I would be, you know, well, let me see the players. And this, this is me being a captain in the club, by the way, just because he wanted me out. I'm coming in at six o'clock on my own with a physio, or five o'clock at night. Um, he'd make me in. He'd be in every single day, you know, weekends. And I'm like, he, he just. And that's what I'm saying to you. Like, without going too far into it, yeah. Um, yeah, I suffered mentally, and there was there was things happening. Like, but he he made my life a lot a lot worse. than one when he could have helped me a lot more, if that makes sense. So, yeah. without delving too far into it, it could have been a, an an opportunity actually. As we trust you, you you're a senior pro. You. You're in your 30s. We, we get it. Get yourself fit. Well, we'll find the pathway for you. We'll help you up, not you know, maybe near near home. You know, mm-hmm. check in with us. But none of that was happening. It was it was we're gonna we're gonna make life even harder for you. So that's why I kind of like even saying not saying too much about Danny Wilson. He mm-hmm. he's the only manager in all my time, and even like leaving football and going to coaching, I've ever experienced some somebody really to do something so far the other way. Yeah, and I've from other interviews, hasn't he, with players from that era? It seems that managers then they didn't like injured players to be even around the place. Mm. Do you think that's Do you think that's changed now? Yeah, it won't be allowed now anyway. I just think the, the times have moved on. I think look, foot injuries are part of football, right? It's <coughs> excuse me, it's the, it's the care behind the. I guess the, what's the journey going to look like? How are we going to make that that almost as, as best as it can be in terms of the support networks you have with sports science, with the physios, with the player care team, with the manager, the staff. There's a network around each player now to, to make sure that 
yes, we, you do get injured. It doesn't mean that's the end of the world. There's, a, there's going to be a really detailed plan, and we're going to support you to to achieve it. And that, if that means that you're going to spend some time away doing it at the club, whatever, whatever it is, it's it's a more joined up approach, which is an holistic approach actually to 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 help the player in, in every area. So if it be a physical injury, but they're going to help them mentally, emotionally. You take care of them in, in in the best way. I just think, like I say, that was almost a, a thing of a, a typical old school situation back in the day where, yeah, they just want the team that are fit and stay stay with me. That doesn't happen now. It won't be allowed. I don't I don't think I don't see any club behaving in that way now. No, not at all. And since hanging up your, your boots, hasn't he? You've forged an amazing coaching career. But just to go back to when you did call time in your career, and it obviously wasn't through choice, it was through injury. What were the, the weeks after like in terms of, did you have a plan for life after football or did it come as a shock? Yeah, no, even though I knew where I was going with this, kind of had a feeling there was no plan. So, again, we weren't going too far. As it transpired, my divorce came through. So I retired just before, yeah, my birthday. Divorce came through. I had to sell everything that I had. I had to give out all my money that I had to the, to the ex-wife. And I found myself back at my mum's house in, in a room from actually from living in these big houses and having whatever and you know experiencing all the great things in football to all of a sudden having no plan, what do I do? Just sat, sat in my mum's house, mum and dad like, what are you doing? No idea. So yeah, the the, the ending, the transition for me was was pretty extreme. Like I say, everything kind of fell apart at, at once. And yeah, even though you kind of had a feeling for yeah going through a divorce and going coming to the end because you knew you had some some problems with your knee. You kind of turn up, turn your turn your head away because I don't know. Maybe maybe I didn't have the right right people around me to help me and support me. Like I said, that journey towards the end of the time at Swindon Town. If if this was not happening now, there'd be people certainly around you, talking to you around what what's it, what do you want to do? What's what what's what's happening with your life? What would you like to do going forward? Because you know you ain't far away. But it happened, and like that, it was like, what are you going to do now? So. Got lucky. Paul Dickoff was great to me. I did, like I said, I had a month really less, more or less thinking, what am I going to do here? So it was the football that I knew. Um, I kind of chose to try and get back into the football. I started watching, I tra travelling around for nothing, what, just watching training sessions and, and what have you. And Paul Dickoff said, look, go and work with the under-14s if you want to learn about coaching. Go and work with them. But there's a good little setup there and you can come and work with the reserve team, but for no money. We'll be getting paid, but come and shadow uh, Lee Duxbiff with the reserves. I'm like, brilliant. So I found myself with Oldham Athletic for that first year, just retired, um, working with the 14s and 15s, learning how to coach, going doing my UA for B license with the PFA. Um, and yeah, I'm having a year of literally flying around everywhere with no money for nothing, borrowing what, like £10 for petrol off my dad and stuff. It was incredible. But it was the best year we had in terms of right transitioning. I, again, just another moment of me doing it by myself. Just got on with it. Look, got lucky with Paul, and yeah, um, I, like I say, within that that first year, I was going into Man United to observe because people who were at Man United when I was there were still there. So they were, I was getting advice of them and how to you know approach different things. I was never expecting a job. And then yeah, I think it was the following October or September. I got a phone call saying, "Ask come in, want to speak to you." We, you know, we want you to come in and take out under 15s. I'm like, what? And I was like, there, never, you know, like I say, that that journey then really kicked off in terms of me moving forward with my life again. Uh, but yeah, that, that transition, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and do you think, Hasney, in terms of the difficulties that you faced in, in your personal life and the injuries particularly, do you think that's made you a better coach in terms of on a personal one to one level with players? Yeah, no, absolutely. There was a couple of factors, really. I got lucky, obviously, working at Man United with, with some world-class operators, educators, facilitators, whatever, however you want to call them, but great, great people, people who were just on the process of personal development. They were just wanting to wanting to improve every day. Every day was a chance to get better and be a sponge, and I was just learning, on the, I guess, the how to coach. Um it wasn't about the outcome. It was always about just every day, just look to try and nick things off people and come in and enjoy yourself and enjoy being around the kids. And you'll you'll have you'll have the best experience if you just stay open minded to to listening and learning and applying some of your knowledge and all the experiences you've been through. So yeah, that was one aspect. But then, like I say, the other aspects of it, yeah, absolutely. My personal experiences around 
yeah, playing the game and stuff away from the great uh, the game as well um, helped shape me as a person in terms of, I guess, the empathy towards the kids and going in and, and not just thinking it's just about the football. It was always a little bit more for me. It was all about trying to get to know the kids and um, find out what, what school was like and what are the hobbies, who's your mates, what you're doing at the weekend. You know, it was wasn't just about te- you know technique and tactics. It was it was me trying to understand the, everyone that I came across, which I think held me. That's why I probably stayed there for the nine year, nine or ten years that I was there. Yeah, and that element of it has is really important, isn't it? Because we're talking now a day after Deli Ali spoke to to Gary Neville mm. about his uh, issues in the game, and he said that Everton manager Sean Dyche has, has talked to him, but so far they've not talked about football. It's only been about how he's doing as a person. And now in today's game and into today's society, that you know the the person is first and foremost, isn't it? Well above football, absolutely. And I think it's always been, but with like you say, there's been barriers. There's people being afraid to speak out. There's even I've shared a couple of things there with you. I've probably never spoke about before. Um, it's just I just think it's with with time, people are becoming more open to talk, and I think that's the only the way. That's the best way forward. It's the only way forward for me to to make positive change, to make make life. I don't know, a lot more open for people who are struggling, who've gone through you know, issues, and like we all do. Like footballers are not robots, coaches are not robots, people in life, whatever you do, you, you're suffering. You suffer, not to say every day, but there will always be things that are like, what is this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this. There's a, there's a, there's a, real, there's a real issue issue here, but without talking, without being able to, to worry about what people think, um, and have anxiety about, well, if I say this, what's going to happen now? Mm. Then you're not going to get the likes of Dele Alli coming out and, and speaking because when Dele, Dele, when Dele Alli talks about his journey, there's a, another thousand of them, easy, within football alone, right? So it was sad to hear what what, what you know what happened with Dele Alli. Um, certainly working with the PFA as well now. Obviously, Dele's a member of the P- PFA. And I, like I say... Um, I empathise with my, you know, I've got my own journey. I can only think about what's happened with me throughout my life. But I'm, I'm, I'm certainly saying that Delhi is not alone with the issues he's come out with and the, the, I guess, the journey he's had. There's a lot more than you think that I've had a, a Delhi Alley journey, and probably even, even worse. If I'm honest with you. So, uh, change only comes by by people talking. You know, and like I say to you, things happened to me ten years ago that won't happen to me now. You know the way he was treated at certain times. That was happening now. You know people will be getting fired. You know these, these these things won't be happening. So I just think the only way to go forward, like I say, it's so sad to hear what Delhi had come out with yesterday or the day before. I think the only way we're, we're going to get better in society and in, and in life is being able to be open and, and free to speak and like you say and share experiences and and move move forward with with, with I guess with life because of it. Because without it, then, like you say, you're going to turn up on a Saturday, people think, oh, you're playing rubbish. But actually, Delhi's played rubbish. Just have a little listen to this. And this this could be happening to so many footballers. This, the, they say, a lot of the journeys are so so varied. Not all are linear. Not everyone turns up in a Mercedes or a BMW at age of 13 and 16 and 18, and then all of a sudden they're in the Premier League. They're probably not. More likely that the the inner city kids that have grown through, they've had loads of struggles, there's been this, that, what have you, and they've managed to find a way to, to be a footballer. If you look, if you unpin, unpack it and see it, it's not pretty. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's um, it's certainly it's certainly a good thing for, for everybody to to understand that life isn't just about football. You know, there's, there's a lot of things happening. Yeah. And you mentioned at the start of the interview, hasn't he? You know, Sir Alex Ferguson was... He would, you know, very grounded. He'd talk about respect and who you were representing. So what was it like for you when you joined Man United to to pass on those values and be, at, you know, the first of the dreams, as they call it? Yeah, incredible. And then it, you think it's, it's crazy, really, because then you, you join the coaching staff and then you present it in front of the boss and you end up sitting down having some time with him and he's like, you're sat there like a little child, you know, um, and he's asking, you, how's things? How's your family? How's how's your mum? These are the questions, you know, remembered my name. You think I've not seen you for all these years. Um, spoke about my time at the cliff when he was when he was the manager, he used to come across. And then, yeah, just some real pointers. And, and he, I guess fundamentally he was just maintain, you know, make sure, make sure that you, every single day you come in here that you, 
you enjoy yourself, uh, enjoy coaching. It's a privilege to be around kids. Uh, enjoy the journey. Don't get caught up in results. It's not about just winning games of football. It's about a process here. The, the aim is if we can get players through to our first team, then yeah, OK, that's great. If not, the aspirations of the journey for everybody involved, that when they leave Man United, that they look back and think, wow, a bit like what you did. Wow, you was wowed by the, the people around you, the coaches, the football, the, the games and... And I, and I think when once you wear that, it's like, well, you know, the preciousness of trying to win a game, it's nothing. It's, it's making sure that that environment that you create is is incredible. It's inclusive for everybody. Um, and enjoying, enjoyment was was absolutely the massive part of it. Now, the, the other side of that, there was times when like, you're coaching and, and the boss would be stood there watching on the side and you, you, you're doing your session, you're like, you know, you're panicking a little bit. And it, but then all of a sudden it just becomes a norm and then you find yourself, and I'm not name dropping here, but you, you're coaching and you, I mean, I was doing some of the Champions League games under 19s. We got going away with Nicky Butt, Ryan Giggs, and you're there just coaching on the grass with ease and it's like, you pull it back a bit. This is Ryan Giggs, this is Nicky Butt, this is Paul Scholes, you know, so Alex Ferguson's watching what you're doing. Having time with Jose Mourinho, you know, picking his brains around. We went to a tournament in uh, in Benfica, sat with him for an hour, going through tactics and what the Portuguese players will do. And coming back after winning the tournament, he's like, you know, giving you big hugs and things like Louis van Gaal giving his game plan to us, you know, talking through this bit. Honestly, I could go on forever about the the openness the club had for me. I guess the, the learning that I took was, was incredible. And um, like I say, nine, nine wonderful years there. But, but like I say, stemming, going back to it all at the start from Sir Alex Ferguson to to then almost kickstarting my my coaching journey, like it kickstarted my football journey, the playing journey. So it was it was amazing. Yeah, and what's it like, hasn't he? When you see those youngsters and they're being trained by like Ryan Giggs, Nicky Butt, and then you've got Mourinho there, Van Gaal. Um, what's it like to see the players taking in that information? Because I'm sure they just must be transfixed, really. Yeah. It's, it's it's certainly it's one of all right you you you're almost part of it and you're almost like feeling like a player yourself because when they talk it's like bang your ears been up you know these these are these are world class football players operators that have been at the highest highest level for you know for years and that Man United these are the best so everybody when whenever anybody spoke there was total respect there was there was literally a an understanding of, right, we're going to try and pull this off as best as we can. It was never an, a moment I saw in all that time where there was a lack of respect anywhere. It was, it was, it was, it was top. The environment was top. It was obviously on the, on the verge of like, but not, not fear. However, you just always, you, you had that feeling of like your preparation, your planning, your communication, your, your overall organization of like, when I turn up today, this is the, this is where I'm going to go with this. And you left no, I guess nothing uh, to, to chance if that if that makes sense. And when you was around them, you just felt they never made you feel like a uh, like you shouldn't be there. It just felt like you know you was part of the, the the group, the staff, and everybody was so open to share, which was uh, I guess amazing for me. And then the players, like I say, how can't you be inspired by them people, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you mentioned Osney, you know the the Champions League with the under nineteen. You were under seventeen technical coach, under sixteen head coach. Um, who were some of the, the players that you worked with who have sort of made the grade? Uh, there's been quite, I guess, the most uh, notable one with Marcus Rashford. So right. when I first joined the club, Marcus was in the system, I think he was under 14s at the time. So I had a lot of time with Marcus within a, a, there was a different programme. It, it was a full-time programme that Marcus sat in. So I was one of the technical coaches for that. So spending spending lots of time with, with Marcus early doors with I guess his technical skills and his mastery, his ball mastery was it was incredible. But like being around and seeing the level of player he was, so Marcus would be the obvious one. Obviously, Mason Greenwood was, was another, which obviously his headlines are not not good at all. But the journey I had with Mason was amazing in terms of his his his. I had around six years with Mason. What a, what a what a great talent he was, and Angel Gomez, who's now lit. You know he's he's coming to the fore. He'll be back in the Premier League soon. What an incredible talent and what a what an amazing person he is. Angel Gomez, Jimmy Garner, who played for them as well. The, the list would go on. There's so many. Um, Dean Henderson, the goalie, when it's a signing from Carlisle, the big goalie. What a what a great guy. He, honestly, got very fortunate to be around <clears throat> some top players. So I guess you look at Langer, he's in the first team. Uh, Scott McTominay when he first joined. Yeah. Uh, 
Will Fish, who's just gone to Hibs, who's back at Man U. Yep. Lots, lots, honestly, the list goes on. I'd be very fortunate to just be around. But again, when, when anybody asks me about this, I don't, I don't, I don't turn around and go, it was this coaching session or it was the, it was the coaching around this. It was, we were tasked to not mess this this journey up. And that meant like the environment, creating the right environment for each player. Every player was different. It was very much bespoke for everybody who who were trying to, you know, everybody, you know, you're trying to get into football, but you if I'm mentioning them names who were, I guess come through at Man United, it was the journey was a very, very bespoke one. So games programs were all different, coaching programs were all different. Yeah. Um it was very tailored to each individual. And I guess Man United were pioneers or trailblazers of going away from like you're an under 13 player, under 14 player. It was very, it's very much uh, what suits the player. Um, I mean, that comes back to attention to planning, the detail around it, where they're at physically, uh, mentally, uh, you know, socially. There's just so many aspects around that the journey was, yeah, like you say, this sat this here now discussing for, for hours around the yeah. uh, an individual about how, how we get, are we getting this right? What's the program looking like? What's the, what, you know, in six months' time, what do we need them to have? So that was a journey for, for all, all, a lot of them players. So, if not all, so yeah, very very fortunate to be around some wonderful players. Uh, but again, very each player I talk about, so so driven to be the best version of themselves as well. So we had that environment, but they come in and they just they, they flourished. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned James Garner. I'm an Evertonian, and I I really really love watching him. I think he's such a clever footballer. He almost like if he finds himself in a difficult position, it always get out of it. And I yeah. think he's really smart. How much if that is James Garner, and how much if that is Man United in terms of he always gets his head up and he's always going forward, and it's almost like he's always scanning around the pitch. Yeah. Is that sort of his ability, or has that been taught to him as well to to develop him? J- Jimmy, I would say Jimmy. Out of them all, Jimmy had to work really hard. Jimmy was. Um... He came into our full time program, so he was he was one of the best players. However, he was always very small and tiny, so he was up against some big guys around him. So Jimmy had to learn how to survive. And by doing that, I had to be really smart on the ball. So before he received it, checking his shoulder, being very much aware what was around him before he got it. Because otherwise, if he was getting the ball, then looking up, the ball was taken off him. So J- Jimmy's journey was always one way he was fighting, um, certainly to s- survive in that that elite environment with your Rashfords and your. You know, your Gomez's, your Greenwoods, all these top players, Brandon Williams, all the, all of the top players that were around him. Jimmy was always a little bit smaller and had to find a way. Now, Jimmy played, we played Jimmy in, in all the positions you can think of. Played him as a centre-half, as a right-back, centre-midfield player, um, left-back. Jim, Jimmy played around um, to, to understand, I guess, the areas of the pitch and how to survive. And every everything always came back to Jimmy before he received the ball. He had a really big picture. He knew what was coming next. And I think that's translating now. A lot of it to do with Jimmy was with his, was his mindset. What a wonderful character Jimmy is. Uh, seeing him not long ago, I'm proud of him because just a hard-working young lad from Liverpool, a uh, uh, humble family um, who's maximised his talent, well, his, his talent through hard work and and determination to be the best version of himself. And it doesn't surprise me that he's, he's starting to do well. And he will be a big force for Everton, Jimmy Garner. Absolutely. He has got all the attributes to be, he can control games. You know, and he has, he's shown that in the past at Forest. He's shown it with England in the under 19s, under 20s, now at the 21s level winning the Euros. <clears throat> he played right back. So Jimmy's, Jimmy's a massive asset for Everton Football Club. Um, he just needs to keep playing. Yeah. And you mentioned, hasn't he, you know, that contact you had with Louis van Gaal, Mourinho. How much is what you do on the day-to-day um, based on the first team in terms of, like you said, about working closely with Marcus Rashford? When Marcus Rashford is at the age to sort of break into the first team, are you told certain instructions in terms of how the team is set up at that time, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, listen, I think the academy, the academy system itself was almost umbrellas, right? So, because of the productivity and, and the, the volume of players that always came through at Man United, the, the club had a, had a big trust in, in what we were doing was right. It was the, I guess, when you get to a certain age, you're going to start linking in like with Mace, with, with Marcus, with, with a lot of other players. When you get into that point of, is he going to go up and train with them? Is you know where are we at with it? Is he is he is he now finally going to you know flee the nest and go? You're almost getting to a point where. Um, 
that that moment of transitioning up to that up, it, the journey doesn't stop it's just making sure we're marrying up with where it's still that linear idea of like uh Marcus needs you know he's going to still learn how to score goals his timing of runs his hold up plays his receiving skills that that kind of uh, profile goes up to the first team and it doesn't just get left there so there's obviously loads of discussion loads of meetings so for example that would be perfect example of like you're not just left to go there and it stops it's the journey's ongoing the i guess i think they've got it really good now at united when they hear about it yeah. that would be an example of when you're transitioning through and you, you you're moving through into that world it doesn't stop the development is continued and i think that's what united have been outstanding at is that it's a process it's still you haven't got to the first team and it's done and uh, there's consistent discussion there's, there's a lot of awareness of what the qualities the strengths are areas of improvement and the, that almost the individual development plan is continued throughout with the first team. So it's it's a smooth process when they move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there's that brilliant stat that United have always had academy players in, in the first team. I think it, it goes back decades and decades. What do you think is the key to that? Do you think it is about those values that Sir Alex had and the principles? I think if you, if you look at the club's mission statement, is is very much, you know, youth, youth is... Is almost the fundamental reason the club's there, and it's all all, all geared around the Busby Babes and obviously the you know class of ninety two. The onus of the club is to to make sure that we have homegrown players coming. Well, they, they, I'm not there now, but they have homegrown players, and um, the pathway should always be open for, for for players to get through from the academy, and that's what we want. That's what they want in terms of they they expect uh, players to come through, and that and that means by Excellent coaching, um, excellent people who have got you know the experience there. There's still people there from when I was a kid, uh, so people who know how that how that operates. Um, managers that come in, they understand what they're coming into. It's not we're going to close up and it's just all you know. This is how I want to do it. The club is joined up from the academy. The academy is almost the most important part of the club. Um, the DNA of Man United is to bring players through, and if you. Doesn't matter if you're young enough, you're old enough, you're good enough, whatever it is. There's that it's a famous saying from Matt, so Matt Busby was, yeah, if you're you know, if you're good enough, you're old enough. So it doesn't age is not is not a problem. It's 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 got to be almost a fundamental pillar within the club is to make sure that the, the you know the talent is allowed to, to flourish and, and to get through. And and it's been amazing. Obviously, I've been I seen it first hand. It was yeah, whoever came in when Sir Alex Ferguson left and it was uh, David Moyes and then it was obviously Van Gaal and Mourinho they knew what they were coming into it wasn't you know we're going to do it my way it was the Man United way and the Man United way is yes to buy the best players in the world and, and get them in and showcase that but also backed up and supported by the best talent within the academy um, and that's still going now and long may it continue because it's amazing to see I'm, I was just looking the other day there's a lot of players in that first team Kobe Mainu um, played the other day in a, in a practice game, and I played last last season. So there's a lot of players um, that are about to, I think, shine as well. I think there's some some outstanding talent in that system that will get opportunities. Yeah, and when you were at United during those nine years, you also managed staff across the support services. So that's you know housing, well-being, psychology. Yeah. Just for example, hasn't he? Say a player joins United when they're twelve, and then they get to the first team at eighteen. How many people do you think are part of that journey? A lot. A hell of a <laughs> lot. Um, I don't know what it is now. Um, you probably have to interview Nick Cox for that, the, you know, the director yeah. of the academy. Uh, listen, the, the list is endless because, like you say, for this to work, it's a big it's a big machine, right? And there's, there's roles to play everywhere. There's a big cog that's moving. Um, so, like you say, from the admin women in, in you know in the offices and, say, the, the parents, the family accommodation providers, the sports science, the, the, the well-being, the player care, the, the, the physios, the psychologists, the, the, the coaches. Honestly, it, the list goes on. So you have a real big bubble around every player. Um, like you say, the moment they hit the academy is the moment they get, yeah, they get the full care, the full attention. And, and, and rightly so. It's just, fair play to Nick, how you manage such a big, big machine and, and trying to make it as smooth as possible. Not sure how you do it, but fair play to him because he's kept it going. It's only getting bigger. They say it seems to be 
Um, the club's the club's academy emerging talent he's just so huge now so yeah i mean with, with my role it was i was quite lucky i got i got to work with the the, the club's elite players the it was almost tiered so you had your normal you had your normal um, academy how it runs so your core program so to speak and then you'd have a hybrid one where you, if you do really well you'll come in for an afternoon and you had your, your, your it was called the manus one but the full time program where we'd house them we'd school them we'd, we'd bring them in and train them in the daytime. Um, their programs only. So if you say there's 150 kids in the academy, there was probably a maximum of 11 or 12 across from the age of 13 to 16. So the best of the best. And that doesn't mean to say they'll play for Man United and it doesn't mean the others can't play for Man United. It was just at that moment in time, there was there was aspirational um, levels within within the system to for the lads to, to go and you know, get into. So it wasn't just about winning a game. It was about every day trying to improve yourself to to get yourself an opportunity to be in a hybrid program, doing really well in there. Well, maybe we'll give you a, a longer contract and get you in the full time program. And yeah, which I guess then the the support around that is is very detailed. So yeah, yeah. And when it, when academy players are ready for that first team jump, hasn't he? You know, how much do you think it is about sliding doors moments? You know, there might be a right back ready to play, and then the the first team right back gets injured. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they can be a Man United defender, like long term. Yeah. How much is it based on you know things happening and things going well? Massive part of the game. I always say when you get to seventeen, eighteen, there's a lot of a lot of luck. You need a lot of luck. That means maybe people getting injured, people moving on. You need somebody to give you opportunity so you can actually showcase your talents and that opinion. Somebody is opinion says, "Oh, wow, I like him." There's three areas there. I always say to myself, "It's almost out of your." Let's say you're not taking the opportunity is not. But I, I, you need to get opportunity through a bit of luck, um, and then you need that opinion. So it's three areas I always look at and think. When you get to that age, you've almost got to have prepared yourself that well that when these three things, I always say to my son, when these three things almost start up happening for you, you've got to be ready to take your chance. So and don't get me wrong. There's also the other pl- real plan side, which I think United are really good at as well. Is is almost is, is staging the process and making sure that we're ticking the boxes until that point. We'll give him that opportunity there, and it's the right time for him to go in there and you know take put him there and pull him back out there. But you know the plan going forward, I think United have been outstanding at in terms of almost putting a jigsaw together, but knowing when to put the pieces in at the right time. They've been outstanding with that. However, the other side of it, he's also got to be an element of luck, and you can go back to the Rashford situation when Martial got injured in the European game. Yep. Um, he got on the bench through an injury. Then Marshall gets injured and then he jumps into the game, scores two goals, starts against Arsenal again at the, at the weekend, scores another two. There you go. That came through luck, opportunity, and then someone's opinion to go, yeah, we're going to stick with this. Yep. You know what I mean? So it's two it's sides. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Because just imagine if Marshall doesn't get injured and then when Rashford does get his opportunity, you know, he struggles a bit, you know, just for whatever reason. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, maybe loaned out. It's just amazing how those sliding doors moments, it's massive. Yeah, it is, but that's why I always say when you get into them kind of ages, it's, it's how much you're preparing yourself to, to be ready. I always yeah. say, it, like, did they happen? I think sliding doors moments happen quite a lot more than what you think. But a lot of us, a lot of people don't take the chance because they're not prepared. You know what I mean? Definitely. So giving yourself that, making sure at any given moment, if that does happen, that you're ready to go. Um not sure not many are, if that makes sense. Some, some yeah, are, yeah, yeah. some aren't. Absolutely. Has there been any, not to name examples, but have there been some players that you've seen as a youngster thinking he is going to be incredible and just for whatever reason they've not made it as a, as a pro? Um, it's a tough one, that. I mean, the, the, I've seen a lot of top players who have expected to be at the highest level and be, be asked me to name on here, but I'm yeah. not made the highest level, and they're playing football. Well, I'm ex- I was expecting a lot more from what I'd seen. Um, like I say, is it through application? Is it through a bit of luck? I'm not. Uh, these, these obviously these factors behind that we don't know. Like we just spoke about the Deli Ali situation. Yeah, exactly. just, yeah. It's not so straightforward. You just see some talent. And you think that's expected to be there. Along that journey, you know things happen in life, right? So, um, you know the these reasons behind things, right? So. I, I don't look at it like that. I, ju- I just think some, sometimes I think to myself, I'm, I'm, I like seeing, I like, I like watching football and at all levels. I see Man United players, I see Man United players in League Two, League One, Championship, Premier League, abroad, 
And I think, you know what, I've been a part of that. I've seen all that kind of develop and nurture over the time. I'm so proud of each one of them that I've, they've managed. And it's one of the hardest things to do is become a professional footballer and yeah. stay in the game. And I'm, yeah. I've seen, I see so much. And a lot of them now, when I have coached, I, I see them, in, they're coming to me for coaching now. Uh, they come for my advice, uh, players that I've coached and been around. It's, I feel, I feel privileged that I'm around them and, I think that's through building the relationships early doors with these lads. It's not all just yeah. about you know the X's and O's. It's it's probably more around the the other stuff, the start you know the soft skills, the, the getting to know each person and then spending being honest and, and spending real time and care and attention to everyone. So it's I, I'm, I'm proud when I see when I see players playing football. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, because as you say, you know even the United lads who are now in League Two, that's still a, a monumental achievement to be playing football at that level and and making a career out of it. Absolutely. There's a couple now, Rochelle Williams, that centre half, top player, top lad. He's still playing. I love watching him play. Uh, Terrell Warren, who's at Barrow. Uh, Rose at Donny. Terrell's at Barrow. Yeah. Joe Riley, he's another one at Walsall. There's loads. They're, they're all out there. And I'm just like, I just love because I'm, I'm commentating for the BBC as well. I'm, I'm coming across them. I'm watching these guys. You know, I'm commentating. I'm like, yeah, I used to coach him. I used to coach him. I used to coach. Him. It just makes me so proud when I see it because it's so hard to just stay in it. it I think you get. I think a lot's get an opportunity, and like I said to you, but I think it's very hard to to stay in. And I think it's a it's a massive credit when when they do stay in it and they kind of break through and they and they, they edge through and yeah, they are footballers. Yeah, it's, it's so well, difficult. Yeah. And for the last few years, you've been the coach developer for the PFA. Um, what yeah. does that role entail? Yeah, it's a varied role. Uh, probably as it as it says there, really, I'm, I'm there to div- you know I'm going away from the grass in terms of player developer. Um, even though I do love still doing that, it's more now around supporting lads who are transitioning, uh, coming out of the game, and maybe looking to forge a career into coaching. So being around you know the UEFA B courses in, in the summer, going into clubs and, and running courses uh, to prepare like you know the the guys after you know for when they do retire. Uh, so I'm in around the UA for B courses, um, I'm delivering UA for C courses for, to the scholars. So giving setting the scholars up in terms of getting them a, a coaching qualification, which is part of the scholarship remit anyway. So they need to do that. But that's that's really good for me to see the youngsters and we do some coaching together. And then yeah, the UA for A course, I link in with the FA. So just recently left uh, St George's Park. Um, so the lads who are really moving on with it with the coaching. Um, supporting them on the UA for A license as well. So, in terms of the courses, yeah, um, A, B, and C. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the the the, the biggie of, of the job. However, with the PFA, we we do a lot more as well in terms of research projects. I went to the World Cup last year, and, um, researching on the Women's World Cup this in the next few weeks' time. Um, the stuff around what we, what we do with. In the different departments and supporting the play the play services department and going in to see the first team lads to talk to them about football coaching and whatever else it might be, yeah, it's a very big role, very uh, wide ranging. For me personally, it's fantastic because I've I've every day is a different day for me and I'm, I'm learning as well, which this that's what I love to do. I like to to try and get better, I like to improve, and I think it suits me right now. Yeah. And I saw a fascinating video of you, hasn't he, at Everton's Finch Farm. Um, there was James Tarkovsky, Connor Cody, Michael Keane and Andy Lonergan yeah. who are, you know, ready for that transition as they're getting a bit older now. Can you provide a bit of insight in what goes on in those sessions? And, you know, are you there for, for just guidance or are you training the players to be coaches? What what goes into it? Yeah, they're both really. Like I say, the, the mentoring aspect of, of delivering a course, yeah, the four lads have a it's almost a the, the journey of learning is yeah there's a bit of both right so there's, there's me giving them uh, the skills behind how to coach and what to look for what are the considerations around session design and um i guess the x's and o's right so it's the how you put a session on and organize it and how you manage it and what's your detail within it however um they're all their own on people right so it's it's providing the tools it's getting to be more aware around what what does it look like when you do coach or you know if they do move into management what have they got to consider you know because at this moment in time they just consider themselves they are very much their own commodity their own brand and you go into that other side of coaching management you're responsible for a football team squad staff support staff surrounding staff the club whatever it might be and it's getting to start thinking 
just taking their eyes off themselves and just be very much aware of, right, okay, you're going to coach. What does this mean? How, how are you going to start to plan? How do you communicate? What you're looking for within a, um, a practice? So for me to show them and, and guide them and, and give them ideas and do some coaching for them and then to look at me and, and unpack what I've kind of provided. And then I, I think the better element of it is what are they thinking? What's their ideas? How do they like to see it? bring their own person personality out and because they're all different and, and understand actually there's no there's no right way everybody's different in terms of delivery um so yeah so it's a bit of both really it's me me facilitating their learning and then also them expressing what they think they know and coming together and I think the big part of it is when we reflect and review and we move forward again that's how the journey kind of uh, moves forward yep. that's been been really good for me to get to know the lads in um, in real depth and detail, not just on the pitch, but get to know them as people as well off the pitch. And I think that's 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 like anything. Isn't it? You need everybody needs mentors, everybody needs people to bounce off, and hopefully that's where I am with it with them that they can come to me at any given moment now. Um, certainly with the coaching and anything else that the PFA one are there to help them, um, they, yep. you know, forever. And if they, if they want some advice or support from me, obviously I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be there through a PFA standpoint, but also a personal one as well. Yeah, and in that brilliant PFA video, hasn't he? You know, I, I sit in the Gladys Street and I watch James Tarkovsky every week, marshalling the defence, being very confident, playing with the ball, you know, spraying these brilliant passes. But there was a really nice candid moment in the video where he he came up to you and said, you know, I wasn't sure when to you know stop the session and talk about the finishing. How good is it for you to see, as you mentioned, professional footballers, Premier League footballers, yeah. so keen to still learn as they enter, you know, the the later stages of their playing career? I think that just is an example of of a top top person, right? So it doesn't surprise me. Tark is is in the game, played every minute last season. Um, it's because he's such a, I guess his characteristics as a human being are, are amazing. They're everything you want in a young man, um, being open. Being vulnerable, uh, being confident, be you know, being I don't know, motivated to to improve. That that Taki just to me, you know, he's unlike the other three as well. They, they just demonstrated a, an incredible humility about themselves to to want to learn and to know that oh yeah, the Premier League players and they played for England by the way, but ultimately they know the coaching's a different different little you know, it's, it's not the same as playing so. You know, I've been there myself. You, you, you all have your own lens of how you see things, and sometimes you close off. I don't want to hear it from anyone. I certainly you go to the pub with your mates, like you know, you see it. Everyone's like, "Yeah, he's rubbish." Yeah. <laughs> I always think, like you know, certainly these guys. The reasons why they're at the top level, all four of them uh, are outstanding people. Before anything else, they are they are examples to everybody. And I think that that probably that moment that happened a hell of a lot. I spoke to Taki a hell of a lot as well. Right? These guys are conscious and curious to learn. You've got that. You're on a winner. Like, like I say, if you have 11 of them or 15 of them in your group, you're on a winner. Um, they are they are shining examples, all four of them, of, of how you want um, the future coach, the future manager to look like because there's so much. It's not, I know, it's not me, it's my way. It's, it's an open, it's a forum to have a real understanding and real knowledge and passion and a craft. However, you know you're gonna you can you you're there to pick you can you're there to take and you're there to to improve all the time. I think that was that was just an example of of Taki and obviously I might have known Taki a long time. He used to clean your boots when I was at Oldham. Yeah. Uh, it's just like I say, you build relationships with these guys, so they, they just it's not like a worry when they talk to you. It's not a question. You think shit? Should I say that? I'm not going to swear on here, but can I can I say I that? And it's like, of course you can say it. It's, it's just an opinion. It's a thought. Don't worry about it. We'll find a way. And I've never seen the perfect, I keep saying it, in all my years, I've never seen the perfect session. I don't know what, what, what the perfect session is. So as you go on there with an open mind to, to try and make the, the session the most fun and enjoyable for the people that you, are around you, you're on a winner. If you can get in there and do some real good coaching and it resonates with someone, wow, well done to you. However, it's a process. Right, that one session is not going to change the world. It's just you keep going, you keep wanting to get better. You as a person, you as a coach, and the players, and you're not far from being wrong. Yeah, and you mentioned Tarkovsky uh, used to clean your boots, and I know at Oldham when he was coming through, he was known as like the new Mott and Beckenbauer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you did you expect him to to play in the Premier League? You know, what was he like as a youngster? Was he a player that, as you mentioned, like James Garner, did he have to learn, or was he was he ready for football? Do you think? 
do you know what? I didn't see Taki play because he was injured when I came. He had some something happened to his feet. Um, he was in a real bad way, Taki. But what I do remember, he uh, he was an outstanding person. Um, a very, I don't know what was the word what I got with him. It, it was almost, yeah, I was a first team senior player, right? He he was very engaging towards me. He he. He, he almost imposed his character towards me about how he was from like Manchester Oldham. He knows that, yeah, you know, some of your family, yeah, yeah. He he gauged the bond with me, and which is quite unique from a young kid, you know, talking to a senior pro. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't never forget that. I just thought, what a, what a lovely young lad you are. Good, I hope he does well. You know, you just don't know. I just, I hope it does. And then what happened when I left? Uh, Mick Priest, who was at Oldham at the time, he was the like the academy manager. Used to say to me, when I speak to Mick, he say, "Taki's going to be good, you know. He's going to be really good. He's just going to be patient with him. He's going to move on." I'm like, "I hope he does. I hope he does." And he did. He went. I think he went to Brentford. I think yeah. the Brentford was his first move. And I started to watch him the football. I'm like, yeah, he's got all the potential to do really well here. But again, going back to his character, going back to his personality, he's opened doors for who he is as well. So yes. You see it on the pitch. However, Taki's, um, I don't know, I guess he's, he, the, the old demeanour around Taki, he's got a presence. He's got a presence of, um, I don't know, it's a real positive, without being fluffy here, you know when you're in his environment because it's, it's there's energy. There's there's yeah. a real good feeling around you. That makes sense? Yeah, Taki's absolutely. certainly one of them, here, and he was as a young kid as well. And do you think it's that personality as well as his ability that makes him a mainstay in Sean Dyches? You know, ever since him and he, he was a mainstay in the Burnley team as well. Do you think yeah. personality is something that matters to some managers? If if I think when you hear some of it coming out now, I think it's always been there. You you want leaders and you want characters in the team. I think if you strip that back, you, you're talking now, you hear about we want good people. One good people, one good people, and you keep hearing it all the time. What's he like as a person? What's he like? You can see the talent. There's some there, there's some qualities. He can do that, but it won't get you in a changing room. So managers, coaches, they do the, the, their own work now around who the you know the the person is. Is it's almost more important now than what they're seeing day in day out on on a on a Premier League game or on a I don't know some, some kind of information from a recruitment staff it's who who's the person what's he like he's got a family what's he like as a person what's he been like throughout his journey you know it does he educate himself not to say that that's all perfect but trying to understand what that person is and what he represents I think gets you through a door and and you stay in a in, in, in a door if that makes sense because of the I don't know you can you can have you can have qualities all over the show, you can be the best player, but you can be a wrong one. And being a wrong one, maybe that's a bit harsh, but if you've consistently been a nightmare in a change room or you've been problematic or there's been, you're probably not going to sign him because of that. And he might be really talented. So, uh, so I think the, I think the, the attention to detail, yes, with data and science, it's all there now. You know, they're employed by all the big clubs. However, the, the understanding of the person I think is up there with the most important thing. Yeah. And the, the four Everton lads that you were uh, coaching, you know, they've all had their 30th birthdays now. Have there been any young players, like 21, 22, who've, who've seen that path and are ready to, to sort of do that after their playing career? Uh, yes. I won't name names now because it'd be, no, be fair. But because of the couple of years I've done it now, you can see... You can see this, this real talent. There's a real uh, dedication to want to be a coach, to to, to understand the game. <clears throat> Some really good players, by the way, who are playing well now in the league. <clears throat> Young, 19, 20, 21, you're like, you've got this now. What a start in life you've got. You're playing. However, the idea of understanding the game is going to help them get better. So understanding the coach, and they've, they've got that me mentality now to say, this is going to improve me as a player. And also... When it does come to transition, these guys are going to be fully loaded and fully ready to go. Like, so as an example of, I don't know if you heard of Anthony Barry. Yeah, I was going to ask him about that. Yeah, yeah so I don't know Anthony well, but I do know from a lot of people who who's, who've been around him and his attention to self development and understanding coaching came early doors from the age of 26, 25, maybe a little bit earlier. Doing all his licenses, finishing his doing his pro license, and then all of a sudden, people like Frank Lampard. Um, Looking at him, going, love to have you. Don't know him, but love to have you in my coaching staff. I'm just seeing what you know, the type of person you are, and courses, your attention to detail. So, yeah, there is people, 
um, and that that is exciting. Um, that uh, actually, it's not just football um, or and that's it. It's football and so these guys are actually they've got the capacity to know that they'll play. But however, they've got enough time to go and explore and develop themselves whilst they're playing. And obviously, coming through through the coaching ladder is is one example. Yeah, and just finally, Hasney, um, your son Sonny has uh, signed for United. Um, you know, I know he won the FA Youth Cup. I've seen that he's, you know, met player of Cristiano Ronaldo standing at Carrington. How proud is that for you and, and the family for him to come through the ranks at the same club you did? Yeah, no, listen, very proud of him. Um, again, probably more importantly, from dead honest with you, he's he's a he's a wonderful person. I'm very proud of proud of him all the time. I just think he's he's a wonderful example of you know the journey's not been so linear for him. He's he's coming from a, a split parenting and you know, two different homes and all the rest of it that probably will come in terms of a journey which you probably don't know about. Um, I mean, to position himself where he, where he has now and getting himself a, a professional contract man United is, is, is incredible. Um, yeah, he's obviously got some qualities on the pitch and, you know, he's got to keep going, working hard and keep believing in himself. That's that's absolute for him. Um, but again, for me, it's the the person he is, the, the character which... Which is going to take him where he wants to go in life. Um, hopefully, he, you know his dreams come true. You know, in football, and he becomes a football player and, and what have you. Where, but it doesn't really matter for me. It's just I think he's setting himself up to have a really good life because of the person he is, and he's educating himself really well. He's put the hours in. He, he does things away way and beyond what he should be doing for his age. And yeah, he's he's a. I would say he's a tacky type. If I'm honest with you, he's one of these young young people who is maximising his opportunity. He's working hard every day. He's a joy to be around. He's just got a, a really good aura of being a good person. Um, and he's doing his best to, to fulfil his dreams. And like I say, if it, if it happens, happens. If it doesn't, for me, I, I'm not bothered. I, like I say, the, the most important thing for me that like, is growing up, giving himself the opportunities, which he's doing now by being a good person. Yeah. Really appreciate your time today, hasn't it? It's been absolutely fascinating and the insights just brilliant. No worries, mate. No worries. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time as well. Oh, cheers, Hasni. Top man.